You're watching AWB TV. Coming up on Capital Focus, is Washington's economy moving into recovery? We talk to the state's top budget writers to learn how the legislature can help. This and the latest news from week 12 of the legislative session. Capital Focus starts right now. Welcome to Capital Focus. A closer look at the issues that are most relevant to Washington employers. Hello, I'm Dave Mastin. Welcome to Capital Focus, where we bring you the highlights of this year's legislative session. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. A low-carbon fuel proposal has cleared the Senate Ways and Means Committee and is headed to the Senate floor. House Bill 1091 requires a 20% reduction of carbon in fuel by the year 2035. Now, California adopted a similar plan 12 years ago, and the results show that the California program has had limited environmental impact but has added about 20 cents per gallon to the price of gas. This cost-benefit analysis leads many employers to say it's a lose-lose proposal. Please contact AWB's Mike Ennis for more details. The Senate has approved an $11.7 billion transportation budget for the next two years. The measure does not raise taxes, but does include $1 billion in federal stimulus funds. The project list includes improvements across the state, including to State Route 29 in Wenatchee and to the I-90 Highway 18 interchange in King County. Senate Transportation Chair Senator Steve Hobbs reports that the state will also direct over $700 million in state and federal funds to retrofit road culverts that block or limit fish passage. Senator Hobbs goes on to explain how every community in the state will see benefit from the package. The transportation budget now heads to the House for consideration. President Biden has announced a $2 trillion plan to rebuild the nation's infrastructure. The plan is directed at transportation, manufacturing, broadband, and a host of other items. But there is some controversy. Although the benefits will be broadly felt, the administration shifted away from traditional broad-based funding sources to a plan that singles out employers to foot the bill. On April 15th, all Washingtonians age 16 and up will be eligible to receive a COVID vaccine. Now more than 3 million Washingtonians have already received one dose and more than 1 million are already fully vaccinated. And with the expansion of supply, Yakima has opened a new drive through mass vaccination site and it's open seven days a week. Coming up next, even with strong state revenue, many Washington employers have had a tough year. Washington lawmakers now have a chance to help our economy recover. We check in with House and Senate budget writers to learn how. Capital Focus. And now, the close up. Despite the pandemic, state revenues are strong and massive amounts of federal aid have been added to the state coffers. But Washington employers and employees still face multiple challenges. After one year of COVID, here's where things stand. More than 200,000 jobs have been lost. Unemployment claims last week reached more than 430,000. 
The state has paid out more than $16 billion to a million Washingtonians. As a result, the unemployment insurance taxes paid solely by employers has skyrocketed. Major segments of our economy are still underwater and now lawmakers have an opportunity to focus in on economic rebound and recovery. Their two-year spending plan that makes up the budget can provide a crucial jumpstart. Here to help us learn more is Tommy Gantz, AWB's Government Affairs Director for Tax and Fiscal Policy. Tommy, thank you for joining me today. Glad to be here, thank you. The House has passed their, uh, their budget, $58 billion uh, out of committee, uh, and the, the Senate has passed their budget, which is $59 billion, over to the House, and so we're, we're at the middle of that process. Tell me what happens next. Well, there will be about three more weeks of back and forth negotiations, and once they come to an agreement, the budget will be sent to the governor's office. And joining us now is Senator Christine Rolfus, Chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, and Representative Steve Berquist, Vice Chair of the House Appropriations Committee. Senator, Representative, welcome to Capital Focus. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Senator Rolfus, you're the Senate's lead budget writer. Please share with us how the current proposal supports economic recovery in our state. Well, the, the budget is a strategic set of investments in not just recovery, but in long-term um, excellence, long-term sustained growth. But in the short term, I'll, I'll highlight, highlight three things that our budget is focusing on. And one is pandemic recovery, uh, getting the vaccines out, making sure we continue a robust system of contact tracing and rebuilding our public health system. So that's actually you know core, it's critical to recovery. And then the next two items I'll highlight are in increasing access to child care and rebuilding the child care industry that had practically collapsed during this pandemic. So getting that industry back on its feet so that parents can get back to work. And then the third, of course, is getting kids back in school safely um, and addressing their emotional and their learning needs so that um, they're back on track and their parents can also get back on track. So those are three things I would highlight in our budget. Thank you. Uh, Representative Burquist, how does the House budget support economic recovery? Thank you, Tommy. You know, I, I really appreciate uh, where Senator Rolfes is coming from. We, we highlight uh, those areas as well, but we, we really do uh, recognize this is an uneven economic recovery and many families and businesses are getting hurt um, and are not recovering at this point. So we focus uh, some additional efforts on over a billion dollars in rental assistance for those uh, families to keep them in, in their homes and um, have make sure that they can pay their rent. Uh, over a quarter a quarter million dollars in business small business assistance grants to make sure that our businesses still um, really finally getting out of this uh, pandemic are, are going to be able to to succeed and an additional 340 million dollars going directly to families. Uh, that are most impacted by, by this pandemic and, and can't participate in other opportunities economically. Uh, Representative Berkowitz, we've received some different stimulus packages from the federal government. The most recent one, I understand, has a little over $11 billion, but there's $4.2 billion of that uh, dedicated to state government. Uh, I understand that you have allocated that, or at least most of it, in the, in the budget that you're putting forward. Can you share some of the highlights of that? Sure. You know, we really want to focus on making sure we can recover from this as soon as possible, uh, but at the same time plan for that future. Uh, over one and a one point two billion dollars just go to help increase our support of projects and infrastructure needs in our transportation and capital budgets, so that we can uh, get back on our feet more quickly and, and make sure that there's uh, jobs for for people and and projects that get done that uh, help our economy recover. Uh, we've also set aside about $750 million in federal recovery dollars for um, another rainy day, just in case uh, we don't know what's going to come next in this crisis, uh, as well as, as significant um, dollars going into uh, business assistance. And Senator Rolfus, I, I understand your budget is, is fairly well aligned in the federal area with uh, the House budget. Maybe you could touch on the unemployment insurance fund. Uh, I know that there was some additional funding uh, put into there from the state budget. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say the House did the same thing. We just, I think we may have done it in different ways. Um, with the, we did not put the federal funds into the unemployment insurance account. It's unclear whether we're allowed to do that. So the Senate used the rainy day funds. 
Um, we have a bill right now making its way through the Senate that would uh, allocate about a little over half a billion dollars in unemployment rate relief for the hardest hit businesses. Um, so, and we did that through the rainy day fund. In comparison with the House's federal funds, the Senate left $2.3 billion unappropriated or unallocated for that rainy day and for further conversations. And then we specifically put some of the federal funds, we put $400 million into broadband and helping to extend um, broadband access throughout the state. I want to shift to capital gains uh, tax, which has been uh, quite a bit of the discussion uh, this session. Uh, I know it's been a lot of legislators talking about. We have it in both. The, it's it's assumed in both budgets. The bill's moving through the process. Um, I, I did a little look back, though, and of course, this has been a, a kind of a, a priority, I would say. Uh, it's been a bill that's been introduced since 2012, and it's been introduced every year. Uh, a bulk of the Democrats in the House have co-sponsored the bill. A bulk of the Senate uh, senators have as well. Well, I was hoping that maybe you could, we could touch on kind of the principles behind uh, why, why, the, why your caucuses uh, seem to be advocating for a capital gains tax. Thanks, Dave. You know, capital gains has long been on our priority list because it's a key tool of reform where the lowest income households pay six times more in taxes as a share of their income than the highest earning in households, um, including literally some of the wealthiest people in the world. And we don't really want to be in the position of relying on our federal government to help our constituents whether that storm in an economic crisis. So we intend to use these federal funds as a bridge. While we stand up our capital gains program in about 18 to 24 months, uh, we would have this tool of economic well-being uh, that can help us with child care and our working families tax exemption. Thank you. And Senator, if you wanted to uh, share some of your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think that the um, the Senate is doing the same. We have basically the same proposals for the capital gains tax to invest those funds in child care and in the working families tax credit. And so to uh, Representative Berquist's point, I have nothing to add about the regressive nature of the tax code. Um, but I do want to say that this legislative session has been really um, the inequities in our economic system and in every aspect of our um, of our culture, essentially, um, the inequities have really been highlighted. And why this state is not taxing the wealthiest people in the world uh, at the same rate that we're taxing the poorest people in our state. Um, I think that's just been highlighted this year and there with this focus on equity, the capital gains tax really, I think, has just found its time. And we'll see if the people of the state agree with that. Representative Berquist, Senator Wolfus, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to working with you in the final days of session. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Uh, good information. I, I guess I, one of the questions that's still swirling in my head is if the tax, uh, if, if what they're saying is the taxes on lower income people is a higher percentage, then the way to solve that is to eliminate some of those taxes. If you're going to if you're going to increase a tax on the upper end, why not eliminate a tax on the lower end, uh, the property tax or a portion thereof, the sales tax, a portion thereof, uh, the B&O tax. These are taxes that if you want a more progressive system, you'd be get, getting rid of those. This proposal doesn't do this. It raises more taxes and then spends the money. Well, and that's what we've been sharing with them is that if they're going to do this, we need to see some offsets. And keep in mind, the numbers that they are referencing uh, are a result of the report from ITEP. And we know that that report is a little bit biased because it automatically takes someone without an income tax and places them at the bottom of the list. And we don't know that that report includes everything around the federal offsets. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of dis debate and discussion around that. Well, Tommy, thank you for joining me again. I uh, really appreciate the information that uh, you provided and, and the guests that you brought on with us. Thank you. Up next, Washington needs to focus on economic recovery. The legislature can help or hurt that effort. One way to help is to pass a capital budget that prioritizes new construction because that's where the jobs are. The good news is that the state's capital budget proposals, both House and Senate versions, are headed in the right direction in large part because everyone worked together. And that is the focus of this week's Problem Solvers. So after the break, AWB President Chris Johnson will lead that discussion.
mod exists to serve people. Spreading modness is defined as the ripple effect of simply doing the right thing. We are unapologetically for profit, but our purpose is to make a positive social impact. This year alone, through pizza sales, we've been able to raise enough money to help pack over half a million meals for hungry kids, using business to make positive impacts on as many lives as possible. And that's what Mod Pizza has become. Felipe Marina is the largest privately owned marina on the West Coast, 1,250 slips. We have about 20 full-time year-round employees. We try to retain great people, and one of the parts of retaining good people is providing an atmosphere and benefits that keep them around and make us competitive in the marketplace. And so we look at the health choice through AWB as a key component to that. Welcome back to Capital Focus. And now, Washington Problem Solvers. Welcome back. I'm AWB President Chris Johnson. Washington's infrastructure needs are vast. Our state's buildings, broadband, water systems, and power grid need upgrades so our state can have a strong economic future. And infrastructure, it's critical to economic recovery as we build our way out of this pandemic. Today, we highlight four lawmakers who are working across the aisle to get projects moving as quickly as possible. Joining us now are Senator Dave Frock, Vice Chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee and the Senate's lead capital budget writer. Senator Mark Schessler, the committee's assistant ranking member for the capital budget. Representative Steve Theringer, Chair of the House Capital Budget Committee. And Representative Mike Steele, the committee's ranking members. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And we'll go to Senator Frock with our first question. The Senate capital budget is about $6.2 billion, and I anticipate that if and when Congress passes a new infrastructure bill at the federal level, you'll have more dollars and projects to consider. Have you had a chance to take that look at the new federal plan and how you'll coordinate that with the state capital budget you're working on? Well, we don't, I, I have not looked um, specifically at the, uh, the federal plan, and I think there's a long ways to go uh, given its size and the funding mechanism. So I think there's, you know, I think it's going to take some time before we really know what the parameters of the federal infrastructure plan are, even if they can get it get it out. I hope that they can. It uh, it would be nice if we could, you know, um, they could figure out a way to kind of do it across the aisle. But it, it looks like <clears throat> because of the funding source, that might be a problem. Um, that said, there is um, a significant amount of federal money that is in, in our capital budget, as well as in our colleagues across the Rotunda's uh, capital budget that was from the previous rescue packages. And in our uh, version, we deploy um, a significant amount of that money towards uh, broadband development. And uh, we think that's obviously a high priority. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Theringer, you represent a rural district. Uh, and I want to pick up on that theme of, of broadband and how important that is in the rural parts of the state. How will the House capital budget help economic recovery in rural parts of Washington? Yeah, good question, Chris. Chris. Um, uh, again, we we uh, we think broadband is super important. We've found through the virus the the need to improve that utility across the state, particularly in rural areas like I represent and Representative Steele represents and Senator Schessler. Um, and the stimulus money has helped us quite a bit in that area because that's one of the words they use uh, as broadband is one of the categories. So. Originally, when we started the budget process, we thought we would have to use dollars to match federal grants, but now we've got this stimulus, so that's going to help us distribute it out into these communities pretty quickly, and that's a great economic uh, mm -hmm. stimulus for, you know, doing the work itself, but also having the broadband to drive health care and education and economic activity. Thank you, Representative Theringer. Uh, Senator Schessler, can you share with us how the Senate budget proposal helps our state with economic recovery and job creation? Well, I, I think we're all in agreement. Broadband is a very critical part of this. We've had colleagues lose connectivity in the Spokane Valley, Olympia, and rural areas. And broadband is the railroad of today versus 100 years ago when it was steel tracks. I think the traditional infrastructure of water, public works, trust fund are all there and very critical to the mission of keeping our economy going. Thank you, Senator Schessler. Uh, Representative Steele, this is your first year in this role. The capital budget almost always has been a strong bipartisan effort. 
Can you touch on that and how this experience may be different compared to the other areas of the legislature? Absolutely, Chris. Thank you for the question. And it is indeed uh, in the House a very bipartisan, and I believe to be that uh, that's true in the Senate as well, a very bipartisan effort. Uh, and we actually do uh, enjoy the development of this budget. And I think the reality is we all uh, sit in a room with a lens toward, especially this year, as we recover from the pandemic, we sit in a room with a lens toward economic development and job creation in every community across Washington State uh, with, with the hope that we can do uh, all we can from the state level to spur that uh, to occur. And again, looking across urban areas, rural areas, large communities, small communities alike, uh, recognizing that the needs we share uh, are typically um, the same. And so uh, again, as everybody has, has mentioned already, you know, broadband and other areas of focus are needs that all communities face. And so that's what I think, I think really does drive a, a bipartisan and cooperative and collaborative process. Uh, for all of you, when I think about this budget, it's a big budget. I'd be curious to get your thoughts of what are you most proud of that's in this budget? And, and maybe also what might be different that's in this budget with recognizing we're in a pandemic that might not have been in a typical capital budget. And I'll open that up to anyone who wants to go first. So we, um, as was mentioned, I think by Senator Schessler, um, Public Works Assistance Account, we think is a great program. It's a program that was, I think, started in the 80s and has actually won national recognition, a revolving fund for sewer and water and a lot of infrastructure projects that normal, you know, cities without valuation or regions without valuation to fund that go to this fund. And so we were able to, to um, since the last recession, there's the operating budget has been taking money out of that fund to help balance their needs. And so this time we're able to backfill a lot of that. And I may not have this figure right, but I think there's about a $6 billion backlog in projects uh, through the Public Works Assistance Account. So the stimulus money helped us with that a little bit. And we're also doing broadband on the Public Works Assistance Account. So I think that ro the robust nature of that account is I think a highlight of this budget. Thank you, Representative Theringer. Others want to tackle what they're most proud of about this budget or what might be different? Yes, I, I think that um, I will go back to my point uh, of the fact that uh, I'm most proud of the fact that we really did uh, look to all communities in Washington State and try and analyze what we thought would be most helpful to those communities uh, in a collaborative way. And I, I think we worked extra hard this year to, to focus on job creation, shovel-ready projects, uh, and, and projects that we thought would help uh, build um, uh, and, and rebuild the private sector uh, in, uh, and, and put people back to work. So I'm most proud of that, that effort. Uh, I would just conclude by saying that I think, uh, I agree with everything that's been said by my colleagues. Um, in particular, I, I, in the Senate budget at least, and, and I think you know, we'll, we'll, this will translate through once we, 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 we negotiate the final one between the two, part, the two houses is the balance that we've brought to this. Um, I think that um, I really uh, appreciate the fact that Senator Schessler, Senator Honeyford, my Republican counterparts um, have, have understood kind of some things that were important to uh, some of the urban uh, and suburban uh, parts of the state that, that, uh, that the majority represents in terms of housing and other kinds of projects. And I think correspondingly, we've been um, a very open, I've tried to do this throughout my tenure is really understand that you know, investing in rural schools is really, really important. Uh, understanding that the economic development needs in the tri-cities is really, really important. And I, and I don't think it makes sense to, to lord over, you know, well, you know, this isn't my area, so I don't really care that much about it. We really have to uh, find that, that common ground. And, and frankly, the rules require us to do so because we all have to essentially agree to, uh, to go out and, and issue the debt that pays for almost uh, for a significant part of these projects. So uh, it, the rules compel us towards bipartisanship. And I know a lot of people are frustrated that everything is very partisan. And this is one area where we I think we've been able to avoid that with a, a good balanced package. And I enjoyed working in that way. Well, picking up on your comments, Senator Frock, this is problem solvers, and that's exactly what you are all are doing as elected officials, coming together to solve the problems of the state and focused on economic recovery. I can't end here recognizing that we have an important basketball game this weekend that's pretty important to the state of Washington, and Senator Schessler, it's in your backyard, that's Gonzaga. Uh, been a lot of conversations. We were off screen earlier talking about mustaches and all, and, and Drew Timmy and all. Senator Schessler, you want to kind of wrap up some thoughts here about 
uh, Gonzaga basketball and what it means to the Spokane region and the state of Washington? Well, you know, a great athletic program puts great universities on the map. And this is no exception that the incredible run of Gonzaga basketball has brought light to the fact that Gonzaga is an excellent university. Their partnership with the UW on a med school is now nationwide in prominence. So the athletics are reflecting on the positive achievements of Gonzaga. And I have to believe they're prohibitive favorites. Uh, they certainly are here at the, at, the, at the AWB family. We're rooting strong for Gonzaga. So I, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to working with you as we go through this session and into next session. Have a great day. Thanks, Chris. Chris. Thank you. Now let's take a quick look at the AWB events calendar. Join us Wednesday for our popular HR and Employment Law webinar series. This event will share the latest information on wage and hour laws and help your business stay in compliance. AWB members will get the latest update from the 2021 legislative session at a free webinar on April 27th. Our government affairs team will cover the big issues that impact employers. To learn more about becoming a member, contact Sean Heiner at seanh at awb.org. There's a great lineup coming together at AWB's spring meeting on May 12th. Education and systems consultant Aaron Jones, sports reporter Jen Mueller, Fred Rivera and Dan Wilson of the Seattle Mariners are the latest addition to this all-star lineup. We'll cover all the big issues related to business, advocacy, and rebound and recovery in this year's meeting. Register today at awb.org events. Tonight we close with this. COVID-19 did not stop the Easter Bunny. Community groups across our state made sure of that. Examples include the Easter Egg drive through Dash in Tumwater, the Relay for Life Egg My Yard fundraiser in Skagit County, and in Walla Walla, the Exchange Club has created the Easter Egg Remix, where local homeowners decorated their yards and the Exchange Club scattered candy-filled eggs on their front lawns for the kiddos to find. It's good to see how in these difficult times our communities are rallying together around the Easter Bunny for our children and for all of us. So here at AWB, we just want to pause a moment to say thank you to all of you that are working so hard to keep our communities our communities. This is AWB's Capital Focus. I'm Dave Mastin. Please be safe, be smart. I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. AWB TV.